so this is a rare occasion because of two things. One, the Atlanta Contemporary Art Center typically does its programming at our facility. Um, part of our reason to want to come over and do an off-site project was to take advantage of um, Emory's Poetry Center and various folks here in the Art History Department. So um, that was the way in which we conceived of having a kind of other dynamic. Um, the other thing is that it's just very rare to bring world-class people to Atlanta who are often not familiar with the city, maybe their first time in the city, and so um, it's a treat for me to sort of be able to welcome John Yao. Um, John's an American poet and critic, obviously um, quite well regarded. He's published over 50 works, uh, including fiction, including poetry, including criticism. He's collaborated with numerous artists, painters, and drawers uh, on unique book projects. Um, we have, not necessarily for sale here tonight, but as part of our shop at the center, his two most recent publications, which is a book of poetry, John Yao exhibits, and A Thing Among Things, which is about the art of Jasper Johns. This is now the second book on Johns that John has done. And a really interesting moment is when somebody takes an opportunity to rethink a previous position. And so this book almost takes apart uh, early John's scholarship in general, but even John's own take on John's. And so this is a pretty kind of magical model for someone and their ongoing thinking. Um, the reasons that I wanted to bring John to be part of our contemporary talk series is that he plays a very interesting role in terms of a multiplicity of activities as a writer, as a teacher. He's currently um, teaching uh, his tenure at Rutgers University in New Jersey. He's the arts editor of the Brooklyn Rail, which is a very interesting publication covering the visual arts and, and um, extended production um, of writers and thinkers. And so we thought that we'd have him make a, a presentation about some of his thinking on John's, and then I could maybe tease out some questions with him in a casual conversation, and then most importantly, you would get to have some questions for him. So uh, it's a real treat to welcome John Yao, and thank you all for coming. So, John. Holbein. Uh, this is Johnson's take on the Holbein. This is Bath. This is Racing Thoughts. So we're going from the 50s to the 80s. This is, I believe, the last image or next to last um, painted cloths. I mean, cloth, untitled, three cloths. And then the most recent would be a catenary painting near the lagoon. So that's his career in a nutshell. <laughs> now we're going back in time. We're getting sleepy. <clears throat> so I've been thinking a lot about John's probably ever since I first saw his retrospective at the Whitney Museum. And I've also been thinking, and uh, this sort of fits in with a class I'm teaching. Um, I teach a class at Rutgers for graduate students uh, who, made, who are artists, young artists, and a 
it's called unofficial readings. And what I ask them to do is to present an artist's work and the official reading of it, and then uh, to present their own unofficial reading of it, and to kind of subvert um, a certain kind of thinking that's in place uh, and to have them learn how to see for themselves, or as Charles Olson says, you know, see out of your own head with your own eyes. Um, and in a way, that's my view of writing about art, that I want to see things for myself. And sometimes it requires you to really uh, look and keep looking at something to get beyond the language that's kind of installed in your head if you're like reading a lot of art criticism. So one of the things that's uh, often been said about Johnson Warhol is that John's is the bridge between abstract expressionism and uh, pop art. It's also say the bridge between abstract expressionism and minimalism. And the other thing that's said is that he's, uh, you know, he painted the flag because it was a flat thing and the painting had to be flat. It's a kind of formal view of reading John's. And, oh, and sort of within all these ways of writing about John's, the kind of thing that becomes uh, repeated over and over is that he's a hermetic artist, uh, that he's aloof, that he's detached, that he's secretly autobiographical, but, but because of his sexual disposition, it's not open, you know, he's gay, he's not, you know, this and that. And I I kept thinking as I, you know, after I first saw Johnson's work, I was like completely taken up by it. Uh, and I literally mean taken up, like what am I looking at? Um, one of the things that seemed to me in all these readings, and they were very dense and convincing, is that it didn't resonate with my experience. And so I thought, well, let's figure out what that is. So the first kind of, I'm really kind of being autobiographical here. The first kind of clue that I got, or insider sense, was that uh, Warhol did this painting most likely after he saw a John's show, and John's does the first, it's a sculpture, and it's the first time he uses a commercial logo, so the beer cans and the stout. So this is called Before and After, and this is, is painted bronze. And I began to kind of contemplate these two words. And I came, I came to uh, a number of conclusions. Warhol's painting is about assimilation. It's about the distrust or hatred of the other. That if you're the other, you're the person that needs plastic surgery to just fit in, to assimilate. Uh, that's what you do, before and after. And also the narrative of the before and after uh, implies that you can change your life uh, should you possess enough money and become the beloved or the accepted. That you can go from the other uh, to the, the one who's part of the world. So in a way it's based on uh, the kind of conventional notion of narrative that there's a before and after, there's a kind of you know, all, all stories end well, so to speak, in a kind of fairy tale world. Um, we know better, but okay. And um, uh, there's a kind of feeling of a desire for assimilation, which I think was strong in Warhol, that he wanted to be accepted, that he wanted to belong, and that this comes through in his work that in a way I, I find interesting because he's seen as the quintessential American artist by some people. Uh, they, the narrative is that, you know, he's the death of painting, which I find a little problematic as part of the narrative. But anyway, I won't dwell on that. In this two beer cans, supposedly the story goes that, uh, and he, John's tells it, I mean, but you can see it in Painter's Painting, the Emil D'Antonio film, where he said that somebody, and it may have been Bill de Kooning, had said, you could give Leo Castelli two cans of beer and he could sell them. And then Johns had made the sculpture. And so they see this sculpture as a kind of uh, 
critique of abstract expressionism, the fact that the abstract expressionists drank a lot. Though if you ask people from Johns' generation, he would say that everybody drank a lot during that period, not just the quote abstract expressionists. And uh, I can tell you knowing poets from that generation, that seems to be quite true. Anyway, so I, I looked at this for a long time, and then one day it occurred to me that this is really a, 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 a not before and after, but the narrative you would read into it is the, is the after and the before. So, right? After you finish the can of beer, and before you open the next one. Okay? And that the other thing I noticed about this, I mean, that even what you haven't uh, experienced is not fresh and new because the can on the right is dented, right? Okay, so there's that. And then the fact is that there's a kind of, uh, that bronze is, is both solid and liquid, that bronze, in order you heat it up and you pour it, and here's the beer can that's been used and poured, and then there's the solid canister of bronze on the right, the can that you haven't experienced, the bronze you haven't made into a work of art, you haven't poured in it, and that after you cease to exist, there'll always be that which is before unexperienced and that which has been experienced, that you don't live between the before and after, but that you live between the after and the before. And you live between what you've experienced and what you haven't experienced which kind of becomes a different kind of narrative because it implies that there is no transcendence, perhaps, there is no happy ending, and there is no escape from your own material identity. So, as I thought about this, uh, and I also was very conscious of the fact that um, people are perplexed about John's. They say there's no kind of theme running through his work. There's no preoccupation that they seem to Again, it occurred to me that here is a common experience that we all have, you know, drinking liquid, let's not say drinking Valentine ale, you know, I'm not going to be that persnickety about it, but that we all drink a liquid and that there's some other liquid example of it that could be, you know, two bottles of water, that's right. That Johnson's work doesn't come from uh, a kind of private experience, but it comes from a common experience. And then I wondered if that was true. What would that, what would that mean? And how would he get to it? Okay, so I wrote that in the um, early 80s in a book. Uh, I'll give an autobiographical thing about his response later. At the same time he did that, he did this piece, uh, painted bronze, which is the paintbrushes. They've been used and they're waiting to be used again, but they may not be used again, right? After the artist dies, this would be an object you might go find in his or her studio, paintbrushes stuck in a can. But the other things, and again, it's bronze, again, it's solid and liquid because the brushes are put in turpentine. That's why they're in this coffee can. And turpentine is a dissolving agent, right? Okay? So I thought about this, and then I thought, just to kind of go back to John's and go back to art, you know, what, uh, what motivates an artist to make work? Um, could it be a kind of meditation, contemplation, attempt to understand what an individual's relationship is to reality? Something larger than, say, autobiography, confession, all the things that people kind of assigned to what John's is about or other artists. Um, and it occurred to me that if we were to go from this work to this work, a map, that it's a solid body surrounded by liquid, the ocean, so that these two things have something in common, right? Though they were done in different periods. And then I started looking harder. And then you could see that the letters are solid form surrounded by something else. And if you know that the painting's made out of encaustic, 
Nectrastic is a material that John uses over and over again. The nectrastic is either solid or liquid. It's never, it's always in one state or the other. So these solid forms, you could say, and that there's a kind of figure ground relationship, right? That's a kind of formal notion. What's the relationship between the figure and the ground? Which you can see formally. Oops, I should turn my phone off. Sorry, I was charging my phone. That's Jasper Johns calling. <laughs> I have to tell you this. He did what's call me right when I was standing in front of uh, the cup we all race for, this painting done by John F. Pito in San Francisco. And he called me and I was like, I'm standing in front of this John F. Pito painting. And he laughed and I thought that. All right, so then again the notion of figure ground. Just, I want to relate that to the solid and liquid. Then a bathtub. And what are you in a, in a bath? With a solid figure surrounded by liquid. Right? And I'm going to slowly go through, and you can see the bathtub at the bottom, the faucet. And again, you can see the bathtub on the far right. Right? So your solid form surrounded by liquid. And then there's this body, if you see in the background, this figure lying down. It's a figure from the Druna Ball. And you can see the three eyes, the three sets of eyes. It's the one that's looking inward on the far left. You'll notice with a pin through its eye, up in the far left corner. And the one in the middle, the eyes are looking out, right? And then on the far right, it's the grandmother, I mean, it's the mother-in-law wife. Yeah, it's either an old woman or a young woman, one looking back and forward and up. So suddenly, or not suddenly, suddenly to me when I woke up one day, I went, oh, because it was literally that kind of moment where a lot of things fit together. Um, I thought that John's work is about That the liquid, the ocean, the dissolving agent, the bath, is that reality, it's something constantly dissipating, changing, and that you're the solid body, and that you're immersed in it, but you're not, it's not over your head yet. You still have this kind of consciousness of trying to negotiate through this reality, but that eventually, You'll become part of the liquid, you'll become immersed, you'll be, you'll be dissolved, you'll become part of this larger thing. That this map is really also just a kind of awareness that how do you how do you deal with time at work? How do you deal with this thing that's constantly changing, using material that seems to be fixed? How do you uh, acknowledge change? How do you acknowledge that change is uh, inescapable, unavoidable, and to some degree um, inhuman, right? That it's inhuman change, that, it's, that, that's, that that's reality, that reality is inhuman in some way, some basic level of reality is inhuman. And how do you, how do you not Seek sanctuary or refuge from that awareness. How do you not want to like comfort yourself and say, no, it's not that. There's some way that we'll be saved, whatever that means. So here's this portrait, a watercolor by Holbein, of a man, a young man holding. We had a long discussion about that animal. I believe it's a lemur. He had pet lemurs at one point, so there is an odd biographical trace. I saw a photograph of him old having a pet lemur. And uh, it's fading, this watercolor is fading. And the painting he does of it, if you notice the top and the right, he's actually acknowledged that the painting is, the watercolor of the paint has been torn away. And then he's made this kind of figure ground where the body, the face is 
wood as if it's the wall. He has these little gray sperm rising up, which is a kind of, you know, birth and death or materiality. And then somehow you're caught between the two. You're part of both, right? Which hardly seems to be aloof or remote. And that, 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 in a way, he's uh, dealing with this work that he's not citing it or appropriating it this kind of way that some artists are known for appropriating work. He's kind of re-seeing it for himself. And then the bath. You're in the bath, and on the wall is the mirror of you in the bath. There's the body. That's in, can you see the figure? And if you know the figure, it's the fevered figure from Grunewald. When you're in a bath, the water's hot. It's like you have a fever. Your body reaches a certain kind of your spirits, right? And what would it mean to be fevered in another way, right? There's a kind of open-endedness of that. So you're the, this fevered body in the water, and the head is above, taped literally above the blue. And the head is melting as if some point it's sweating, but in another level, if you're in a bath and it's hot, generally you sweat. But at the same time, there's the implication that the two will one day merge, right? And that's sort of echoed in a different way by the fact that the head that he picks of Picasso is a kind of merged head and body. see it as a kind of figure that's both a head and a body, right? And if you know philosophically, there is a kind of mind-body problem, as Bittgen's friend will talk about. Like, when, when do they join up or unite? When do they become one? Okay? So suddenly, it's really a painting about someone sitting in a bathtub, it's hot water, becoming aware of A, his body, mortality, you're kind of alone. I mean, most of us take baths alone. I guess there are moments when we take baths with others, but we won't go into that. Nevertheless, uh, and there's a kind of uh, sense of, of, of your floating. If, if you're looking at this painting, it's almost as if it were flat on the ground, because there's the, that wood panel on the wall on the side, which could be read as a wall, as well as a floor that you're floating above this uh, bathtub with this head above the water, and that, in a way, we have gravity. At some point, you're going to fall into that place, right? Right now, you're above it, but at some point, you're going to merge as well with the whole thing. So in a way, I don't think of John's art as being uh, separate from life, but really kind of about what does it mean to live from day to day. Uh, and then, if you think about this painting, uh, on the right hand side is a sign that, that's continued on the left. It doesn't come across so clearly in this one, but it's an image, but it's a, a highway sign that he saw uh, while in Basel on the way to see the Grunewald pieces. Paintings, and it says, beware of falling ice, okay? And then there's again this bathtub. There's the uh, Mona Lisa, and then female, and then there's the skull, right kind of balance, with the split implied by the Barnett Newman print. And actually, I think it's a drawing that he knows. And this is sort of echoed, if you think about it, by the pots. Because the pot on the right, if you look carefully, I guess I should get a point to it, is there's a face here and here. And the, 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 the two profiles are uh, Queen Elizabeth and Prince Philip. It's from a pot that was made for the 25th wedding anniversary of uh, Queen Elizabeth and Prince Philip. Somehow John's got one of these pots because who knows how he did it, but he did. 
So there's this kind of mind-body again, because you, you, you know, you see the heads, the mind, and the pots, the body. Then you can see the faucet, uh, the two faucets, and the kind of, I mean, the two handles in the faucet is almost like mail, right? And that's sort of picked up or echoed by the fact that the uh, indentation in the pot on the left, which is both a pot that he owns by George Orr, uh, that the handle can fit in, or echoes, so then you think of male, female, what that might generate, I think it's children. Um, and then, that's on the right hand side, and then, and that's sort of more interior, this male, female, uh, split, life, death, drive, and then on the left hand side, a pair of pants, public what, what happens, and Leo Castelli, the dealer, which if you look at it is a, is a puzzle, it's a jigsaw puzzle, I don't know why someone made a jigsaw puzzle of Leo Castelli, but they did, and uh, it's like falling ice, what happens when it breaks, right, and then, and this is, it's not so clear, but the way the stripes of the wood imply there's a figure submerged beneath uh, the wood pan of what would be the wooden door. So, you can read this painting because the right hand side joins the left hand side because the writing goes off and it continues. And you can, so, so it's one forming a cylinder, a large cylinder. Then you can read the right hand side racing thoughts the way it is because you see the S before the R, but the right hand side becomes a cylinder within a cylinder, or a form within a form, right? Does everyone see that? So then in a way, you begin to see that it's all there, it's not really secret or hidden. It's that if you get hung up on the fact that it's a Barnett Newman, or it's a Mona Lisa, you kind of get wander off the, off the path, but in fact, it seems to me there's a kind of straightforward way to look at this painting, taking into account just what they are, how they fit together. And, and again, it's a kind of like, what are we made out of? Who are we? What's our identity? In this case, it's, it's partly his history, right? Because he has the art of George Orr, a self-taught uh, potter, the mad potter of Biloxi. He has Mona Lisa, which would go back to Leonardo as well as Marcel Duchamp. He has a skull, he has a Barnett Newman. He has the colors red, yellow, green, right? And then on the left, his public self would be Leo Castelli, a representative, which is dealing for his entire life, I mean, for many years till he died. So that there's a kind of, who are we is made up of different selves. There's no one self that we can grab and say, this is who I am. And we're made up of multiple so I think is an interesting thing to consider. And then finally, there's this, kind of looking back and forth in time, right? And it's pinned to this body, line. You can see the holes, it's the, it's the fevered figure who's got the same bitus dance. Is that what it's called? I can't remember what it's called. It's suddenly the disease, it's from eating rotten bread actually, and it gives you this notion, it's sort of like taking LSD and dying, because it's the same drug as LSD, and it causes you to think you're burning up. You get a fever, kill, and it was a medieval disease that they didn't know, and it's from eating uh, rye seeds and other kind of bread. Um, and the, uh, Grunewald paints this painting with, these fig with that figure in it. Uh, it's like kind of an, you know, it's like this awareness of your own mortality, like what's your future hold? And here's someone looking inward, the one on the left, looking out, looking back and forth. And then it's three ways we see or exist in time, right? Um, that there's the kind of mental looking inward, there's the 
reality of looking at the physical world in the middle, and then there's the memory and imagination looking back and forth in time. Because we can't, we don't, we're not always, when there's that notion of meditation where you are where you are and you're thinking what you're thinking and that's it. But I mean, how many day, times a day do we achieve that state? I mean, it's really our looking, our thinking. And how do we put that into a work of art? And I think really John's is, um, desire is like, what can I get into a painting? What can I get into a work of art? And the, and the, in the sense, it's not about breaking a convention of the abstract expressionist. He says that he painted a flag because he dreams that he, he has a dream in which he sees himself painting a flag. If you know anything about the flag, it's uh, made of three panels, right, that are joined together. And what do you do when you dream? But you remember something, so you put something back together. That's what a dream is. The stars uh, uh, in the upper left-hand corner become a kind of echo of what it's like to dream and sleep and dream. So you're completely alone in the world, passing through the night. Um, and if you look at the painting carefully, uh, there's two little details in the painting that don't come across in reproduction. One is that in the middle, in the exact middle of the painting, it says pipe dream, which uh, was a newspaper collage under the encaustic. Once I saw that, I was completely thrilled, but I kept thinking there must be some other detail in this painting to echo this. Otherwise, I could think it's just it happened by chance, though. I doubted it, but you know you have to kind of test yourself. So under, around the edge of the, I think the bottom or next to the bottom star on the far right is the phrase "United States," and then you think. Oh, that's what you do when you remember a dream. You unite separate states. Okay? I mean, it's so kind of, it's like one of those moments you went, how come I didn't think of that before? It's so obvious, but I didn't. Now, it's not, there's a writing along the bottom, and it says, near the lagoon, and Jasper Johns, but the letters are alternated, so near would be N, and then from Jasper Johns would be J, then E. So, so the letters of near the lagoon and Jasper Johns are dispersed, okay? And then you have this string that hangs down that seems to, it seems to have recorded it coming down further with those two stripes, those two lines. And then you realize, if you look carefully, that it's a canvas on top of another canvas, so there's something underneath, <clears throat> or it's layered, which goes right back to the flag, a kind of compressed space, because the flag, you see the collage, and then you see the encaustic over it. Here again, you see this kind of compressed space of things, or if you think of the three claws attached to the body, the space is made up of layers, almost like the body itself, or skin, right? Near the lagoon, at one point the letters will mix together because that's the water, and then the string is hanging down, and the string will exist and move after we, quote, left the room, or passed from this life. The reality continues. And then to flip it all the way back, He uses language. He uses things that exist in this world. So people have talked about him not being called original. He's using ready means to use the Duchamp word. But in another way, he's saying that the world exists before we arrive, and presumably it will exist after we leave this world. So the language he uses of things are all things that pre-existed him to some degree and will presumably exist after him. At the same time, the colors he uses, red, yellow, and blue, he's tended to use, plus black and white. 
so that there's no expressionist, no uh, overtly expressionist notion as he uses primary and secondary colors in black and white and gray, that this kind of notion of color pre-existed him and will presumably exist after him. So in a way, the uh, language he uses or the uh, things he uses in his work kind of acknowledge that he exists in time and it echoes back with what I think is his preoccupation, what does it mean to live in time? Because time is infinite as we know, right? And we, can, we can't really imagine that at some level. Uh, that's almost beyond comprehension. We have a sign for it, but what does it mean to think about time being that expansive and that we exist in it, right? Because once you acknowledge that reality is that, you know, this expanding universe, and you're this form in it, you begin to think of yourself as like, how do I deal with this awareness? I mean, it's kind of an awareness that we, um, we generally put out of our minds. If, you know what I mean? It's not like you know, an awareness that we want to carry around with us day in and day out at some high level. There's this notion, I think it's among biologists, that if all your senses were working, their highest function at any one moment and we were to, and the mind was to comprehend it, we wouldn't be able to get out of our seat and leave the room, right? But in a way, it's like, if that's reality, how do you get that into your work, right? And I think in, in a sense, uh, that's what I came to think about John, is that he's not the artist that fits into art history in some simple way, it's just the bridge between this and that, because I think, um, that kind of way of looking at art reduces what art can be, its own capacity to be important to us or to have meaning for us, that it's just part of this little history or that, you know, and we kind of set it off and segregate it or isolate it from experience. Well, that's a, I remember in New York at one point, uh, when I was in my 20s, I walked in the show and then suddenly all these people, I guess they were on a tour, came in and they looked, I don't know, they were looking at the paintings for five seconds and they said, oh, that's just post-minimalist abstraction. Got back on the buck, got back on the elevator and left. And I thought, oh God, that's what paintings become, right? Just something that you identify, you get two points recognizing it and you leave. And there's no experience. And if anything, as a poet, I'm always kind of envious of art because I feel like that has the capacity to be experiential, whereas poetry, it's a, it's a different kind of struggle to become experiential, right? And it's different, but it, it's harder, I sometimes think, I don't know. So uh, anyway, that's my thought. Why don't you just stay there, because I'll just ask you questions yeah, maybe, down. or sit down over there. Are you sitting over there? Yeah, see? Sit down. Why don't we do that? I know. <laughs> I think if we talk loud, we'll be able to be heard. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so in, in, for people who've come to some of the talks in this series, um, the format of them has been often this kind of a short presentation and then sort of a, a sort of chat maybe riffing off of that and then some questions from the audience. And I guess, I mean, one of the things that I know, I think I know, but it would be interesting to hear you talk about after this um, particular presentation, which is that when you use, even just in the closing comment, this idea that John's is not just a bridge between this and that, that in a way the whole presentation you made is to argue that John's is interested in the bridge between this and that, right. that he himself in the relationship to time and the relationship to space and the relationship to things which are uh, one thing in the context of another or the blur between information, whether it's numbers and context or where is a state right. in your where mind, is where is right. a state like as a representation. One of the things that's been really interesting over the years is that given all of your dialogue with Johns, he's in a sense never told you exactly that you're right and wrong or wrong in these interpretations. Right. He's, well, I mean, you, you 
you told me earlier that he's on top of it to doing he, something. He, he thanked me for the, the, the piece I wrote about um, the painted bronze and the warm -up. And he, he thanked me, and then he told me an anecdote about the warm -up that I thought was interesting, which I'll tell you. He said that he'd gone to a party took the flowers in, um, that were in a kind of vase in the center of the dinner, I guess, dining room table with a number of people doing it, peeled them and made them into a new flower, and then put them back in the pot. And then he said, uh, oh, pe people think that Andy just kept things the way they were. That's not true at all. And what he did was beautiful and grotesque. That was, that's all he said. Before he did the Brillo box that we got to know that it's red, white, and blue, an exact copy, he did a number that weren't exact copies, but that he had changed the colors and he gave one to John's. And then he came, he said to John's, no, I made it right now, and I want the other one back, and I'll give you one of the right ones. And John said, no, I want this one. And he kept the one that was in, incorrect and the one that he kept that was interesting. You do change things. The other thing in the painter's painting, I hadn't thought about this. If he answers this question about pop art, this and that, but then he says something like, I'm interested in that in the thing just as it's slipping away. And you go, that's kind of striking. You know, that experience, you can't hold on to it. It literally slips away. And that there's no notion of it being a fixed so he is interested, I think, in the states of change between this and that. Yeah, I mean, when you, when, you know, we were talking earlier today about people who may uh, have read the paper um, that Leo Steinberg, the art historian, uh, passed away at 90 on Sunday. And we were, to, uh, you know, and Steinberg, of course, is very famous for his readings on sexuality in Christ, but also taking picture in you know, the Last Supper and a number of very canonical works and almost miraculously giving you new ways of imagining looking at them, which in a sense is what you know John was trying to do here with, with, with John's his work, away from its pop art reading, away from its kind of you know brand logo. Um, but what's been really interesting is that the materials that he uses are so merged with the imagery that he's working with. So when you talk about his use of encaustic, Right. And the caustic is this, you know, material that is heated and then cools and is slow drawn. I mean, that all of it engages liquidity and time and gesture and frozen gesture. Right. That all of those things are like. But here's an artist who's extremely interested in trace right. and residue and and old stuff that feels very much about body and life and, in a sense, what well, happens. There's a painting that he did. That Ball that he put the paint dishes across the board and it's smeared against the surface. It's like time has passed. Like you can't go back, you can't take it away. The painting records that gesture. You know, I think a lot of his work is about that, or the fact that you know the beer can and the artwork are in the same place. Talk a little bit about the the multiplicity of your activities, as I'm mean, obviously you're focusing here initially on the discussion about Johns and two books on Johns. But how do you locate your writing about art within the context of your numerous books on poetry and your interest in film and any number of other you know cultural productions? Uh, I started off. Um, I decided.
had to be right about art because I didn't want to um, end up not living in New York and have a fantasy that uh, I could support myself as an art writer, which is not actually true. <laughs> and then uh, the other fantasy or thought I had was I would learn, I would teach myself about art by having to write about it. So, I, and the poets that I admired Skyler and I like the fact that they lived in the world rather than in a university situation. And I thought uh, that's what I wanted to do. I remember at a certain point, uh, I decided that if I, uh, I wrote for this one particular magazine, I thought if nobody noticed it, I would study to be a, uh, an x-ray technician. That this would be a job that's portable. And I wanted a portable job so I could live in wherever I thought, you know, they need x-ray machines, they use x-ray machines everywhere. So I had this fantasy that I'll either be an art critic or an x-ray technician and I'll, I'll have a portable job. You know, they need art critics, they need people to talk about art. So uh, it was completely, I think it was delusional, but it was a useful illusion because somebody luckily called me up and said, oh, we like your art writing, we write a catalog. And I was like, Phew, I don't have to be an x-ray technician. Because I also thought I'd probably screw it up, do something wrong. You know, I'm not mechanically gifted, as they say. <laughs> so, but I did really think, what's the most portable job I know of that I could imagine doing? And I thought, and would be useful in society. And I thought, X-ray technician. So, pretty happy you didn't really <laughs> your. So, and then I, I began to think about writing that there was, at first there was a difference. I felt like, oh, if I'm writing criticism, I really want to be writing poetry. And, and then finally I realized that that was a trap because you get uh, paid for your criticism and you often, if you write catalogs, get a beautiful object within a month, right? And if you're a poet, you may not have those things happen. Just see them as separate activities, but that what's central to them is writing and learning something. So um, I, I managed to negotiate it that way. And then uh, as a poet, I didn't want to be in an English department because I felt that I didn't I didn't know what a poem was. That there's a kind of conventions of what poems are supposed to be. Feel like I fit those conventions, but I didn't. I wasn't reacting towards them. I just didn't. I wanted to find my own way. So I thought it would be best not to teach in an English department because I didn't think they would a want me. B I didn't want to make my poems fit in. This is proven truer than I realized because at Rutgers University, where I teach in the art department young PhD student uh, contacted me and said, I've been teaching your poems for three years and the English department has never told me that you teach at Rutgers. So I thought, well, I've succeeded better than I wanted to. <laughs> for people who might not know your poetry, would you, what, what, what would you say that over the years your range of poetry has, has um, tried to do? One of my preoccupations is the notion of identity. Uh, I, in the 1987, I started a series of poems called Genghis Chan, Private Eye, so I made up a Chinese detective that was sort of a, a riff on Charlie Chan, but inverting it, right? And uh, I've continued, I, I, I finally have completed the series of 23 years later. Um, I often, during the, have written poems from the point of view of Peter Lorre, who's like a Japanese detective or an Asian, so I write about uh, through the voice of uh, Boris Karloff, who played a number of Asians. Figures that are, quote, white that became, played Asian figures. And, and I pointed out in a poem that I didn't think it was Thought it, was, it was revealing about culture. I mean, I, I'm explicating why I did something that Boris
was a kernel out of play Asians and, and uh, Frankenstein, right? But there's a relationship about how another culture, I mean, how mainstream culture sees, quote, foreign bodies, bodies with foreign accents. Um, and I guess, in a way, uh, I'm interested in identity as not something you're born with, but something that's kind of put on you and something also construct at the same time, that it's not um, inherent in any, any one of us. So, I mean, just to kind of push this further, I did once teach creative writing in the Asian American Studies Department at Berkeley. And so all the students were Asian American in the class. And my first assignment, I said, I'm going to make a list of all the things you can't use or write about. And start with what you said that language is political and how you use it and it's also how do you push back against the conventions that are kind of attached to you. In the process of doing this I read a Frank O'Hara poem and in the middle of this really kind of wild bunch of surrealist lines O'Hara says I'm feeling all cruisy and Nelly tonight and I said that's political say that without embarrassing. And you have to understand there's a way that we use language differently than this kind of expected use of language. And it was interesting because actually two guys in the class came up and said that they were gay and they were staying in the class because they had never known they had never known that this was possible. So I, and I felt like I learned something from that. Uh -huh. You reminded I mean the, the, the just that little comment reminds me of, uh, uh, we were talking earlier about Tom Muskowski, who's a well-regarded abstract painter, but Tom, I think it was in an interview with uh, Francine Prose, says that, I mean, his paintings have always been, he says, based in real world things, but no one has ever been able to really identify what shape might have generated, you know, what, what results of these paintings. And he said in some interview that he thought he would welcome the idea of writers about art coming up with new <clears throat> compound words to try to write about abstract painting, words right. that would be nonsensical, or hybrid verbs that wouldn't really make sense, but would be kind of utterances that might get you to understand in a way what the paintings were trying to do. Mm -hmm. I mean, so in, in part, do you think that some of the history with poetry and art overlaps in that space of hungering for new forms and new oh, ways yeah. of saying things. Yeah, or? definitely. I mean, in my new, in this recent, a number of recent poems I wrote, I tried to write poems based on this kind of skewed notion of the Chinese ideogram, so that it works on a sound, so that sound, it would make sense one way, but then you could begin to take it apart
nice and language, you start to feel like crazy after a while because if you start taking apart every word and see, well, does it sound like this? What does it sound like? And what could I do if I do this to it? And you're and literally breaking language apart. You can, you know, there's times when you think you're not really listening to what's being said to you. You're really just taking it apart what's being said to you. And the other person's like looking at you. Why are you looking at me like this? We have the exhibits book. You have So I have a new manuscript that I published in April 2012. This is the, the title is called My Adventures in Monaco. Based on, uh, I was asked to write a poems in response to uh, the E. Klein show, The Walker. And uh, I said yes instantly. try and use kind of ugly language. So this is Private Eye 13. It's hard to keep pretending you're a yellow chink in a hollow of dusty linen. Begin believing you're just another handkerchief, wiping away the laundress's tears. Uh, so I wrote a number of poems like that where I tried to take certain words and flip them around. And then
the times has changed. They didn't change it that long. So uh, then, oh, there's, then I started to invert things around. was like had no sense of how people would respond to these works. And I remember at a certain place, certain instances reading some of these, and the audience just being dead silent. And the longer you read in that kind of situation, the more uptight you get, you know, it's just uh and I want to like get through the reading as fast as possible. Uh, I once read with a Get to that. 
that in some way without kind of fixing it of like, oh, that's the slang of this or that's the slang of that? Well, well, I mean, also some of these ranges of, of attitudes in the writing go from like an absolute kind of narrator voice to almost a street song. Right, right. You know, like right. the kind of bluntness of a, right. you know, urgent message of some sort that may be broken or not, but, but I somebody else is thinking of working, finding and working with a painter and making the kind of street signs that you put up somewhere. Mm -hmm. you know, not that we put up a <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to just ask one question before maybe just letting other folks uh, ask away. Um, I mentioned earlier that you've done a lot of collaborative work with Archie Rand, with Richard Tuttle, with uh, Max Gimlet, with a range of artists I know, um, in a sense, making unique books or folios of drawing, painting, writings. Can you talk about just what that feels like, why you do it, what, how those happen? Are they born of friendships or, or the desire to make product? Where do they come from? Um, the first one sort of became the guide for a lot of them. summer program at Bard, and I said, oh, we should collaborate someday. I was thinking of the four Harris collaborations, and Archie said, yeah, we should do a thousand watercolors. I'm like, why did I talk to you? <laughs> <laughs> and so I said, oh, well, all right. And he said, I'll come over this weekend. I, I didn't live in Oakland. I was like, all right. And we just decided we, and he had a really interesting reason sense and then we got into it as he said well we have to get over what we know so we just literally had set up at the dining room table I'd have a piece of paper and he had a stack and I would write something out and I had to figure out where the words went and he would do a watercolor and we'd pass them back and forth and then of course it became instantly competitive right I was like oh I don't write fast and you can do watercolor and he's like suddenly there was this growing pile. And then you try all the little tricks like children's book A's or B's or, and of course getting wackier and wackier. And then of course you get through that and you have to go through some other model. And finally it was just like completely liberating. So then I thought, I mean, made me think differently about writing because I, I had been someone who wrote really slowly and banged my head against the table and all those things. I thought, there's a way you can really trust yourself and see what happens. And, and don't be, I guess, I mean, you were bringing the brothers up. Learn not to be embarrassed or to embrace your own embarrassment and not be ashamed of being embarrassed. You know what I mean? That somehow, I mean, I write these things and I mean, often like these signs or whatever they are, and I, you know, my first thought is, this is stupid. And then I go, it's okay, you know, I mean, then I have to go through steps to accept it, or, you know, this is so dumb. And then, but I, I've often told my students in the writing class, I say, don't show me how smart you are, show me how dumb you can be. I don't mean dumb in this intellectual sense, but I said, you know, we all claim to be sensitive, but how many of us are willing to sit next to a homeless person and talk to them? You know, what do we shut ourselves off from? How do we um, absorb experience and use it? Or, or, and things like that, I just try to get beyond my own. I mean, Bob Creeley said, you know, you have to get beyond what happens through your own thinking. And I think that's a kind of great thing to remember as a writer, as an art, someone who writes about art. Uh, I just told the story. So uh, I was with John Ashby, and he had seen the. Uh, Heart of Glass, the movie Heart of Glass, and, and then he said, you know, the actors are hypnotized. So, uh, and then he said, yeah, there's this wonderful scene in the movie where two men are in a tavern, and they're close friends, and one of them gets angry at the other and hits him over the head with a beer mug, and the man dies. And then he said, and then he feels so bad about it, uh, he picks the dead man up and starts dancing. And then John classically waits for like a half a second. That's something I've never seen in movies before. Two men dancing, and one of them's dead. I thought, that's an aesthetic standard, I suppose. You know? <laughs> and, and I think 
is, you know, kind of, I mean, I'm being light about it, but I think that's really how you, I remember going with John Cage concert and deciding on the way there that no matter how I felt, I wouldn't leave the room until it was over. And I knew that was the only way to experience it. And I remember at one point being really annoyed and then suddenly it just left. Someone did run out of the room screaming now. And uh, so someone goes up and says, you know, did that bother you that this man you know, left screaming? And Cage said, no. He said once in Los Angeles he was doing something and this man got in the car, uh, left, got in the car, drove home, pulled into his garage, backed the car up, drove back to the concert. When the concert was over, he came up and he apologized to Cage. I'm sorry, I missed your concert. And Cage said, oh, you didn't miss it at all. And, the guy, and I thought, wow, how can this guy be like that? You know, and it was really interesting. So I thought, how do you accept your experience? I mean, isn't that partly what it is, you know? Any questions? Yeah, I have a million, but I'd rather go this direction. Collaborations, then it's never like the artist, like the like say you you admire an artist, like this German abstract expressionist, and then do you ever take does he ever have his existing work and then you write about it, or is it always constantly you're creating it at the same time for his piece? I think it's we create at the same time. At the same time, okay. pretty much. I mean, I did a collaboration with a German artist named Norbert. Told me what we should do, and I wrote a set of poems, and then I went to see what he did, and I completely was knocked out by what he did, and I ended up writing a whole new set of poems wow. because I thought the poems I wrote didn't do justice to what he did. So that was a, but that was a collaboration with the conversation through email. His English is like pretty awkward, and I was, and I so I thought, oh, I'll write a kind of style like Paul, it won't matter, I'll, I'll play with sound, and then I was sort of like, huh, that's, he did something so delicate and beautiful, I figured I had to do something different. So it, he does metaphysical type things, do you do metaphysical type I try poetry? to, yeah, I mean, I literally try to fit my work in with the arts as a way to get beyond my, like, um, one time I did Told this artist Squeak Carnwrath. He has a very extensive book, but it's a vocabulary that she uses over and over again. I said, uh, let's figure out this project. Why don't we do a box and I'll write a uh, hundred poems and you make a hundred images? And then it occurred to me to write a hundred poems that were all two lines long. So the title would be one of the lines and the one line. But I, it came from having a conversation with her, and it got me to think about, oh, I'll, I'll do this kind of poem, which, you know, I, I don't think I would have necessarily thought of it otherwise, but I thought, um, how would I write a hundred one-line poems? Like, so I also, I think as a poet, try to I get myself in the dilemmas. How would I do this? Can this be? This is why I accepted the Eve Klein project, because I knew I couldn't write. I mean, I love to write poems that have a kind of pictorial element, and I thought with uh, Eve Klein that that would be <coughs> problematic since he's a monochromatic painter. So I knew I was putting myself in a corner, and I had to figure out how to write myself out of through it, out of it. I mean, I do that, I think, a lot. And when you have that challenge, do you ever go to the artist? Oh, with Eve Klein, with Eve Klein, what I did uh, is I used things he said, uh, but then I also made up things.
Jesus has said. And then uh, I kind of got bridegroom, so you can't, hopefully you can't tell where one thing ends and another thing begins. Uh, I started to connect him to other poets that he probably, I mean, I connected him to Baudelaire and we never met, but I have Baudelaire saying, this is why E. Clyde was born, because I wrote this poem. So I try to, I mean, I really kind of tried to get Eve Klein's voice as if I, I tried to channel Eve Klein. Um, that's possible. And I think that comes out of, you know Jack Spicer's work? He said that he took dictation as a poet. And I really kind of believe in that notion that you're not writing it, that you're really the conduit for something. Uh, and it, it's a way to put your ego to the side. mystery to it in the end, you know, that somehow he's making me look at something like a map or a flag in a way that we never really looked at. It. I mean, I, I went to the show at the Whitney and I was like completely puzzled. I had read about his work, but I hadn't seen it, and I just kept going back, you know, and, and I could, there's only a few shows that that's happened. I mean, Richard Tuttle was another artist, and I didn't know situation where I don't know what I'm looking at. You know, I like it. It's, it's, I don't know, it's just something I'm attracted to. There's a moment where I, I think I think that's too hard or too weird a way to look at art, but I really, I love looking at it. I look at lots of things, but there is that moment where you go, what am I looking at? And that's like the great moment, I think. So I think there's that. I think people refusal to be autobiographical, you know, I mean, the fact that this painting sold for a million dollars before anybody else, I think, becomes a kind of wrong reason to look at it. But think about it, he's the least entrepreneurial of all artists, right? I don't think, and then the other thing, I mean, I said this to my students, if you take Stella and you take John's, John's work never becomes more expensive to make as he becomes more successful, right? And Stella's becomes more and more expensive to make as he becomes more and more successful. So on a really basic human level, Stella believes in class, and John's refuses that. He rejects that notion of, of the way we relate to others, that he wants to make work that still anybody can see that it's not about how much it costs to make. That I think is really important. And that to me, it doesn't get bigger and bigger. You know what I mean? It doesn't get more and more expensive to make. You feel like it's always just this guy alone making work. He doesn't have dozens and dozens of assistants doing it for him. That's entrepreneurship. And in a way, I think, I think that's also why certain theorists want to believe that painting is 
debt, right? They want, they, they want art that's entrepreneurial, and I don't quite understand that, you know? So you get people promoting Damien Hirst or Jeff Koons, but that's really about the collector wanting something like someone like him or her, right? They're entrepreneurs, and they want, they're narcissistic enough to want an entrepreneurial artist. They feel comfortable with that. And there's a kind of mirroring that's going on. Don't want to talk about class in the art world, but it exists, right? And I think it's uh, uh, it's something I try to talk to my artists about. I try to talk about artists that only use like affordable materials. I mean, I give a whole lecture on that, like Bruce Connor, anybody that uses really inexpensive uh, affordable materials. I kind of promote that as the aesthetic that rejects the entrepreneur. And in a way, I can tell. Vizkowski, uh, I mean, I mean, you know. Yeah, I mean, yeah. yeah. I mean, any I, number of any number of people, but, but all of those people tend to be solo practitioners who reject the spectacle of making art and respect, in a sense, the publicness of the artist. Right. All those people are pretty hermetic to right. some degree. Right. They may be visible, but they're still primary solo kind of in their own space. I think society can't things. stand people want to be all by themselves in a room. You know what I mean? I mean, they think there's something unhealthy about that person. You have to get that person out of here in the sunshine. You know, and it's like, no, I want to stay in the room. I want to close the door. I'm not going to answer the phone. And they think there's something really unhealthy about that. You know, I think that's why society can say, oh, we don't like poetry because we don't understand it. But what they really don't like is that guy wants to sit all by himself in a room. And just write. That's unhealthy, right? What are you doing up in your room, Billy? Get down here. Join the table, right? They don't, you know, as a kid, you're supposed to not be alone in your room. Your kid who knows what you're doing up there. And I think that feeling is continued. You know, if you're an adult, <coughs> you must mean it if you're alone in your room. Because, you know, odd saying, I think they really distrust that. In a way, I don't blame them. It is public as artists are because they do give their work, work back into the world. There is something not slightly antisocial about being an artist, right? There's a kind of rejection of, of the group, even as you give something to the group. And I think society doesn't know how to deal with that. You know? So I think they focus on people who are social, like Jeff Koons and others, because they in a way, it's their way of one talking about success. But it's, I think, their acknowledgement of their hatred, their unacknowledged way they hate art. You know? I guess it's also boring to talk about. What did you do in your room today? Oh, I wrote 83 words, you know? <laughs> and I thought I was a genius. <laughs> I think. And but I can't think of any better way than to end than just to thank you for coming out of the room. Oh. Uh, <laughs> into the sunshine. You, <laughs> you know, uh, you get out in a variety of ways, but uh, a real a real treat to have you in Atlanta. Well, thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And as I said, um, we do have a handful of John's books at the Art Center. We had the pleasure of, you know, sort of like having John come and see what we what we have on view, and so it was interesting to hear his take on some of the exhibitions that we have up at the moment. Um, those shows, by the way, end this weekend. Oh, go so see the Danish show. Yeah, she's, she's terrific. If you have not had a chance, um, come and see us on uh, Saturday or Sunday. Or, um, but again, thank you all for coming. Thanks, John. Thanks, Emily, for hosting us. It's great.